Good morning, everyone. I hope you like the intro video. I always have one. I don't know why. But uh, Richard, Rebecca, thank you for having me here, taking me out of my island to bring me to very beautiful Metro Manila, right? Took me about two hours to get here, wherein uh, it will only take me 25 minutes to get around the entire Spring Valley facility. I'm here to discuss something which is quite critical. And I'll give you a little bit of a caveat. Half of the room is not going to like what I'm going to say. You know how controversial I am, my friend, right? So Derek Gallimore from Outsource Accelerator has been to the Valley. Jomari has been there. And the Secretary Mon, of course, has always been there. You guys, I haven't seen you there yet. Hopefully, you could visit soon. Oh, no, sorry. Stand corrected. Victor already uh, visited the Valley. So five years ago, I became the president of the oldest IT BPM industry association in the Philippines. It's called the Philippine Software Industry Association. It was called the Philippine Software Association then. And we've been going at it for about 30 years now. So when I assumed the position, mind you, I'm not tech. I'm supposed to be a lawyer. I ended up being a liar. Uh, when I assumed the position, I asked myself, so do I just charge the stage and try to pretend that I'm talking about something that I actually know something about? Or am I going to do something really significant for my country? For those of you who have seen me on stage, I always wear two things. The flag on my left lapel and my rosary on my right hand. Those are the only two things that I need to actually tell the story how it's supposed to be told. Uh, the theme for this conference is actually, baby, we're back, right? Because we've seen a lot of very scared stakeholders in the industry, especially coming into 2018. Because we were thinking, all of these disruptive forces that are out there is going to destroy what the likes of Mon, Jomari, Don, myself, and so some other people in this room have built since the early part or even middle of the 1990s. I came into the BPO space. I came from the BPO space. I came into the BPO space when technically there were only four significant players in the Philippines, namely Sykes, eTeleCare, People Support, and uh, who else is there? Sykes, eTeleCare, People Support, and Ambergris Solutions, which is now Telus, right? So there were only four. It was so difficult to explain to your grandmother where you were working, right? I'd say, I work in a call center. And three hours after, they still don't get it, right? That's basically the entire topic for the reunion. What? is going to happen to the industry now. Allow me for the 20 minutes that was given to me. Thank you again, Richard, for asking me to do the impossible. Allow me to actually just go through some of the things that we see as industry leaders and how it is affecting what is now called or what was called the sunshine industry of the Philippines. First, this is who I am. I've uh, been honored thanks to the manhandling of Undersecretary Ibrahim to take on the National ICT Confederation of the Philippines. So just a little bit about the PSIA. There's about 160 plus software and IT shops that are members of my community. Some of you are actually in the room. So the biggest of the big, the smallest of the smallest part of my community. The three big ones that we have here, of course, would be Accenture, HP, IBM. And then we've got the startup community that's composed of about two, three people trying to figure out where they're going to get their next meal. They're all part of the community. Now, the NICP is something which is unique, and this is the gentleman who actually is responsible for putting this together. The NICP is now composed of 81 ICT councils all over the Philippines. This is a, another crazy bunch. You know, you should go uh, to one of our events and see you know, that everything is just totally different. We've got ICT councils up north, down south. There's a lot of them in Mindanao right now. There's a lot of significant activities coming from all of these ICT councils, especially in terms of the rural impact sourcing side, which means that the NICP has contributed immensely to the 1,500, 1.5 1, 1. million 
OFWs, or what we call the online Filipino workers. So there's 1.5 million of them. But just like anything else, we have challenges. How do we now move from where we were and transform this nation into a digital country? One of the problems that beset us, and yesterday was the PSIA's first quarter general membership meeting. Unanimously, with the 66 uh, companies that were in attendance, we were all complaining about one thing. Business is so damn good, and hopefully for those of you in our space, you're also experiencing the same because then again, it's going to be lonely where you are. Everybody's complaining. There's just so much business coming in. Where the hell are we going to get the people? And what are the problems that actually beset the industry? Allow me in about three minutes to actually go through the factors that are contributing to these issues as well as the key ingredients in terms of transforming the Philippines into a digital nation. So the first problem is really in terms of the talent gap. Uh, anyone from the academia inside the room? Going once, going twice? Then allow me to badmouth them. Uh, there's a lot of issues. For the software side of things, we still have to train for about six to eight months the 3% that actually comes into our pipeline. Six to eight months of salaries. And these are some of the factors that are contributing to that. We've done a lot of conversations with the academia and hopefully it will translate into something much better. Second, this country is just so in love with services. Services, services, services. Within the PSIA, 95% easily are doing services. Why? The price points are nice, the pipeline is strong, it's sexy. Third, startups have their own unique set of challenges. We Filipinos are very risk averse. I would rather put my money in a bank and get the 2-3% rather than venture into something that I really like doing. Majority of the startup founders are still employed. And if push comes to shove, they go back to their jobs. They're going to forget and abandon any of their aspirations. The next one is something that Mon and I have been intimately working on. Only 30% of the entire IT BPM industry goes out of Metro Manila and Metro Cebu. We've got companies like Saitel who have contributed to the growth of the countryside. We've got Sutherland, you've got Con uh, Converges coming out. But 70% of the graduates actually come from the countryside. And yet, we import them to Metro Manila. Hence, look at the traffic that's happening here. And then there's no central technology and innovation hub. Ladies and gentlemen, we have 7,400 islands. Some of them are basically being stolen from us, but it's still within that, uh, within that area. 7,400 islands. Don, I saw your reaction. Uh, seven, oh, we, we found another 241, so it's now 7641, according to my very good friend in the professional Googler, uh, Joe Marie Mercado. Uh, and I was thinking, I certainly do not have the strength and the capacity to go into each and every area to promote the ITBPM sector. So there has to be an area wherein people could actually converge. So what I did was I constantly asked myself this question. And this is the same question that I asked myself five years ago when I was having my caffeine and my nicotine. It was, they were still a little bit liberal with, their, with nicotine taking in BGC then. When I was having my caffeine and nicotine, I said, what would it take to uplift the nation in this digital age? I came up with four points. And these four points are actually resonating to a lot of my countrymen and all the different stakeholders in the Philippines now. These four points are basic. Aggressive shift from services to products. The sad truth, especially for, for my fellow Filipinos in the room, is that when you go into the sacred halls of Microsoft, and Google, and LinkedIn, you're going to see a huge, huge component of Filipinos working there. In fact, one of the good stories that I would like to tell everyone is, of course, we are all familiar with Excel, 
right? And the person who actually led the development of the Excel team used to be the president of the Philippine Software Industry Association. He's a very good friend of mine. And probably some of you know him already intimately. His name is Joey Grango. Just so happened that he's also from the same province where Spring Valley is. But of course, he's not going to tell you that. Why? His NDA is this thick. Guess what? I don't have an NDA with Microsoft, so I'm telling you, right? But that's a secret. Second is fast and effective interventions in education. If you're going to change curriculum in the Philippines, it's like giving birth to 10 kids all at the same time. So there are workarounds that, you know, Joe Marie uh, propagated when he was heading IBPAP then. So there's the 12 units were in this and some elbow room that we could infuse new topics and uh, new modules. But basically speaking, even when I came into the BPO space, latter part of the 90s, there was no academic discipline that is going to prepare us for a life in the IT BPM sector. And the same still holds true now. There's still very few academic institutions that are offering learning modules that is going to produce the type of people that we collectively need. So the secret here that we found out in Spring Valley is we just won't care. I never thought that the attitude of not caring is actually going to produce the output that is desired. So we, we teach 10-year-olds uh, robotics. We teach 14-year-olds 14-year-old uh, database management systems. We create, I'm creating a truckload of animators in 2D uh, specialists. What are they getting? Are they going to get, you know, DepEd certified or commission on higher education? Who the, who the hell cares about that? As long as they could answer one particular question. Could you do the job? In fact, right now, I'm probably the biggest entity that offers on-the-job training and internship because that's also a very huge part of the problem. In Rebecca's province, which is Pangasinan, when I went to the Gupan and I was looking for all my software developers, they said, they're not here. <laughs> Where the hell are they? The moment they go in their OJT, they go to Clark, they go to Manila, they go somewhere else, and then they never come back. So if a new locator comes into their area, in as much as they produce formidable roster of technologists and innovators, but they're no longer there because the ecosystem is not present. Hence, they will go where they could make a living. The third one is to build a sustainable startup ecosystem. So right now, most of the startup players here in the Philippines are those that could afford a Starbucks lifestyle, right? Stay here with my MacBook Air, look cool. I'm going to do something that's going to change the world. Five months after, your parents are going to be all over you saying, get a job, get a real job. They end up working for PLDT. No, I'm just kidding, Vic. Huh? So, <laughs> but that's, that's the, the reality of the situation. Startups, you know, we, I, no insult intended on the secretary, Mona, I was also part of the group that came up with the target. 500 startups by 2020. Woohoo! And then we found out that Bangalore has 25,000. Right? Now, not by 2020. Bangalore alone has 25,000 startups. But, surprise, surprise. Areas like Again the Oro are already producing about 25, 30 startups at every given cycle. Where do they go? Most of them end up getting jobs because nobody's listening to them. Some are saying, you're in the wrong island. We're not going to put money, money there. Second, they know how to build the tech. I've seen beautiful tech in the countryside, but nobody knows how to sell the shit out of it, right? You get them in a room with a couple of venture capitalists and they look like cats that are staring directly at the headlights of an oncoming car. Exactly like this. You ask them what they've done, they can't explain it. But they've done it. Fourth one is a formula that has worked for us way back 2004. So there was the uh, contact center, uh, what do you call this? 
the Contact Center Association, there was uh, Outsource Philippines, there was so many. This is the Philippines. We have an association for everything, right? And then government said, <laughs> the table is laughing because I, I'm actually saying something which is, which is very close to my, my heart as well when it comes to actual experience. Government said, I have a check. Who am I going to give this check to? Why don't you guys organize yourselves and come up with a mother association? Hence, BPAP was born, which is now uh, known as IBPAP. We need a single united front of key stakeholders. There's some activity happening here. There's some activity happening there. It's making our heads spin, but there is no real spearhead. So what I told myself was this. There is a very unique marriage between software and hardware that is happening. Okay, some call it IoT. We, don't, we dare not say it in public because we're from the Visayas and it comes out differently. Uh, only, the, only the Filipinos in the audience could actually, uh, could actually get that joke. Uh, there's a marriage of software and hardware that's happening. It's not just software alone. In fact, all the skills that we need from a PSIA standpoint five years ago are not even the same skills that we need now. So how do we now do this? And you could only do this by coming up with a dream, a moonshot, right? So two years ago, I told myself, enough of the metropolis, I'm moving back. I'm moving back to the province, right? I want to have board meetings and board shorts. And I, I chose a very ugly place. So to my left is Boracay. To my right is actually Sikogon and Gigantes. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, go to my island. And there is a truckload of talent that I found there. The greatest moonshot that I've ever created in my life. In fact, this is no longer business for me. This is now what I call a life, a life goal. So there are only two outputs when it comes to life goals. One is that you achieve it. Second one is you die trying. Either way, I think I'm okay, right? Midlife crisis hits people in different ways, right? Some get a Harley, some buy a yacht, some get a mistress. I decided to put up the Silicon Valley of the Philippines. So half of my friends automatically two years ago unfriended me. Right? Oh my God, he's lost his marbles. There's no way that that could happen. There's no way that we could steal manufacturing of tech from China. There's just no way. It's the knee-jerk reaction. You want tech done, you go to China. Ladies and gentlemen, there's so many things that are happening in the environment. One is that the cost of labor in China is actually increasing. So the only way that they produce affordable uh, gadgets and gizmos is because the ecosystem is there, the equipment and the raw materials. Those could be easily be ported. But talent cost is something that is very sensitive. Second, this gentleman named Trump. So I've got a lot of Chinese friends of mine from Shenzhen calling me up saying, Jonathan, you best partner in the Philippines. We bring equipment to you, you stamp, made in Philippines, and then we send to USA. And to which I said, uh, no, it's not going to happen. Number one, it's illegal. Second, what gain would my country get from this? Now, if you want, send us the raw material. Send us the equipment. I'm going to use my countrymen to actually produce all of those things. You teach us because we, we are fast learners. And then we're going to build it from the Philippines and send it to the U.S. Then it is really made in the Philippines. So what I did was I created different facilities that would have different functions. So this is where I am. I start in Roja City in Capiz, but right now we are expanding. We're looking into Batangas for Spring Valley, uh, the tech manufacturing arm, which is Spring Valley Arc. We're looking into more Visayas facilities and more Mindanao. Why? There are going to be pockets of brilliance everywhere. But it is also unfair for you to take them out of their communities and bring them somewhere else. Pretty much what like Metro Manila has done to the industry. So what I'm doing is I'm creating small business units 
all over the Philippines, which also means that I have to travel all over the Philippines wearing board shorts and flip-flops and build technology and innovation. So we have essentially become Silicon Valley of the Philippines. Guys, allow me to wax a little bit sentimental about this. Two years ago, I have to literally kidnap people to bring them there. Uh, Attorney Bob is there, who's also the, uh, the lawyer of IBPAP, and I just invited him to come over. Literally, I was kidnapping people to bring them there because I had nothing. I had a couple of PowerPoint slides, and that's pretty much it. Right now, just give it a try. Let's go there and see the kind of craziness that we are doing in the Valley. So there's startup support. Uh, unfortunately for us, most of the takers of this startup support system are the foreign startups. So I'm doing a lot of very, very beautiful things for Korean startups, for Taiwanese startups, for Japanese startups. Of course, we have a software development uh, component. We now have hardware and prototyping. Aligning ourselves with the requirement of software marries hardware. And last but not the least, because I am the mouth of the South, and I do this thing about 200 times a year, I also help in the promotions and marketing of some of the startups that are under our roster. So this is the genesis. That's an actual picture. Uh, that small dot in the horizon is actual. Oh, you can't see it from here. But uh, you know, for those of you who hit our Facebook page and see this uh, particular picture, at the back of my facility is actually the biggest statue of Jesus Christ in Asia, a little bit taller than the one in Rio. And our goals is very simple. Uplift educational standards, create as much Philippine intellectual property as possible, and establish a nationwide network dedicated to technology and innovation. Uh, through to form, we spat out so many products already. What we do in the Valley is every two months, we have to have a new product. So one of these, sorry, I'm, uh, I need to say this, Vika, but one of the products is actually supported by the competitor of PLDT, okay? So I'm not saying the brand. But uh, they picked up OJTPH.com, which is the on-the-job training platform for the Philippines. So it enables us to actually find the right person that you're looking for in your company and for the candidates to actually work for firms that they're actually aiming for. Uh, we did the Boracay Access. This is crazy. Hopefully within the year, the task force of Boracay is going to declare that you have to pass through my Boracay Access to get to the island. So it controls the number of tourists coming in. So it's like your visa portal. And then I Protect, of course, is one of my prime products. It's actually making its debut in Vietnam next month. It's, uh, I, it's very plain and simple. I was having coffee. I was looking at my security guard. My security guard was busy putting all of these stupid notes in what they call a logbook. And I said, what are you doing? People could be coming in and out of this facility already with an M16 and you still don't notice because you're busy putting stuff on your logbook. And he said, sir, my auditor is going to come around in about an hour and he's going to audit my logbook. So I told him, could you open the, the, the cabinet at the back of your podium and what I saw there was a lot of dead trees. So essentially, they just keep on consuming all of these logbooks. And when I look at it, it basically says something like this. This is really funny. 10.30, nothing follows. 11 o'clock, nothing follows. 11.30, nothing follows. There's no analytics to it. There's nothing. You can't use that. In fact, of all the times that there were incidents, I looked into the entry. It wasn't there. Why? Sir, I was busy taking care of the incident. So I said, I'm going to automate the security guard's logbook. So now they're all using uh, uh, smartphones. All the security guards are there. And then they take pictures. They upload it. They, they put on the tags and everything else. You know, sometimes I could see a lot of uh, selfie pictures of my security guard. But honestly, I don't check them anymore. 30 minutes, if I don't see a picture of the four corners of my facility, it means you're sleeping. It means you didn't go around. So now they're very adept in using technology, and we're doing this in the countryside, for the love of God. We're doing this in the countryside. 
So just some of the intellectual properties that we created. So the facilities that I have is basically three. Spring Valley Academy, which is a non-traditional, non-conforming educational facility. So with in, any of my friends in the industry who go there could offer short courses or even one-day seminars. So the last one that we ran was actually about mindfulness. And I didn't realize that that was such a huge topic because we had a full house. And then we've got SPRINT, which stands for Spring Valley Incubation and Training. So that's where I incubate most of the foreign startups that go to me. Now we're getting an attraction from all the other incubators in Visayas and Mindanao, and they're sending them to me. And then the latest baby that I have, thanks to the support of the Department of Trade and Industry, is the Spring Valley Arc, which is the Advanced Research and Knowledge Center. And there's a very nice story here. Year and a half ago, I was telling my staff, I want my prototyping and fabrication facility. And my executive assistant said, how the hell are you going to do that? I have no clue whatsoever, because I know that these things would cost an arm and a leg. So, Department of Trade said, we have funding here for what is called a TBI, a technology business incubator. Why don't you send a business plan? Sure, we'll take it. When do they need it? Sorry, you, Sekmon. Just like anything in government, the deadline was yesterday. So you have 24 hours to create an entire business plan. So we did not sleep, me and my team. We sent it, we got approved regional, uh, we got approved provincial, regional, and national. Boom, I have more than 10 million pesos to basically buy all the equipment that I want. So I'm a crazy guy who actually sends emails to Bill Gates, to Zuckerberg, you know, just in case. They'd answer, right? Hey, maybe you'd want to be the keynote speaker for SoftCon for this year. One of those emails I actually sent to Massachusetts Institute of Technology Fabrication Facility. And I said, out of the kindness of your hearts, could you give me your equipment list? Lo and behold, they answered. They didn't only answer, they sent me the specs, they sent me the price, they sent me the, the sources. And they said, good luck, Jonathan. We visited your site. Seems that you're as crazy as we are. Here's the list. So I basically replicated the exact same equipment list of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Again, in the province. So the services that we produce is basically just threefold. I will just focus on Spring Start. Here's the scenario in the startup scene. There's what we call a hustler, which is typically people of my profile. Then you have the hacker, which are the technical guys. And then you've got the designer. Eventually, when they transform into real companies, the hustler becomes the CEO. The hacker becomes the CTO. And the designer becomes the chief of operations because he's the one who's designing the entire business. So the problem with this is that that's a perfect scenario for startups. Usually, it's three computer science friends, uh, three friends who are taking up computer science who say, who's saying, hey, maybe our thesis, let's, let's create a, a new entity out of it. Let's look at it as a business. So it's a hacker, a hacker, a hacker. And the worst type, a hustler, a hustler, a hustler, right? They keep on selling to each other without actually writing a single line of code. So I saw this problem and I said, maybe let's fill in the gaps. Let's create a program called Spring Start. So the startups, like the one that I'm doing for a Korean uh, healthcare uh, platform, it's called Line Care. So technically, there's a CTO and there's a CEO, and then that's it. The CTO doesn't know how to code. So he comes to me and says, could you design the web page? Sure, borrow my designer. Could you create the back end? Sure, borrow my back end, guys. So right now, we've actually gone to their minimum viable product in record-breaking time. It's like in three months, they have something to sell. And mind you, they've been winning startup competitions left, right, and center. The last one that they won was for 50,000 US dollars, and the guy wasn't even trying. Number one advantage, he's 25 years old. He looks like a Korean uh, K-pop star, so I, I guess that helps, right? I tried doing the entire Korean thing, it doesn't work for me, so. And last but not the least, come December, we're trying to 
build the biggest technology innovation jamboree in the Philippines. No suits allowed. We will actually shoot you if you come five kilometers from the venue if you're wearing a suit. And this is going to be a conference and startup expo, drone racing, there will be robot wars, there's cosplay, esports competition, pitching competition, and a rock concert. So it's like the biggest tech carnival in the world. Now, the important thing is, I'd like to ask everyone here, especially my countrymen. Sawa ka na ba? Sawa ka na? Vic, sawa ka na ba? Hindi ba? 7.8 billion capex, so you're not, uh, you're not sawa. Sawa actually stands for, well, what are you sawa of? Picking up after someone else's trash. Always on the receiving end, never on the, give, on the giving end. Taking care of other people's children. It's a sad statistic, huh? When I ask my people, who are children of OFW? 90%. are basically saying, I grew up without actually knowing who my father is or my mom is. Constantly following, never leading. And also, Rebecca mentioned something a while ago. We need to be a first world country. So are you sick and tired? Sawa for our foreign guests here. Is are you tired of being second class? Now, if you have these attributes, you have the skills, the attitude, you're willing and you're able, then maybe you belong to a place like Spring Valley. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in this journey in creating a digital Pilipinas. Maraming salamat po. <laughs>